Good day, everyone. My name is David Williams, Executive Director of the International Association for Energy Economics. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar entitled Trucking the Potential and Pitfalls of Carbonizing Big Rigs. We're grateful to our moderator, John Kingston, and our distinguished panelists for today's timely discussion. But first, a little bit about the International Association for Energy Economics. We're the largest association specialized in the field of energy economics and provide a forum for the exchange of ideas, experience, and issues among professionals interested in the field. The organization produces two professional journals, a newsletter, and holds conferences and virtual presentations, along with a host of other products and services that you can find at our website at www.iae.org. If you're not already a member of the association, we welcome you to join. A few housekeeping matters in regard to today's webinar before I hand things over to our moderator. First, this webinar is being recorded for those that cannot attend today's live event. If you have questions for our panelists, please use Zoom's Q&A option at the bottom of your Zoom uh, screen to post your question. We've allocated sufficient time at the end of this webinar to address your question. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to our moderator, John Kingston, Editor-at-Large at FreightWaves. John, over to you. Dave, thank you very much. And uh, everybody, welcome to this IAEE webinar. That could not come at a more timely occurrence. Uh, I am the editor at large at Freight Waves, and on behalf of Freight Waves and myself, I want to thank the IAEE for allowing me to moderate this discussion. For those of you who don't know Freight Waves, we are the largest online source of news and data for the trucking and freight industries. We were ranked 85th on the recent Inc. 5000 list of the fastest growing private companies in America. So just to go over those numbers, that's 85 out of 5000. We're very proud of that. And now in our fourth year, our timing couldn't have been better to launch a supply chain focused information service, given the upheavals in today's supply chain. Our webinar, as, uh, as Dave said, is entitled Trucking, the Potential and the Pitfalls of Decarbonizing Big Rigs. And given the attention on the supply chain uh, and on a tight market for truck drivers, uh, is a perfect time to have this discussion. We're mm -hmm. going to discuss the energy efficiency and outlook for trucks, where the ability to decarbonize runs into some issues that you don't find in the outlook for decarbonizing automobiles or the power grid, we've got a solid panel here to discuss these issues. We're joined today first by Mike Roth. Mike has worked in the, in this, in the commercial vehicle industry for over 30 years. He is the executive director of the North American Council for Freight Efficiency, and he leads the trucking efficiency operations for the Rocky Mountain Institute Carbon War Room. His specialty is brokering green truck collaborative technologies into the real world at scale. He has a Bachelor of Science in Engineering from the Ohio State University and a Master's in Organizational Leadership from the Indiana Institute of Technology. Um, I'm, I'll do a quick introduction of everybody else. So as you're looking at the webinar, you, the Zoom, you know who they are. Alan Schaefer has been the Executive Director of the Diesel Technology Forum for almost 20 years. Earlier in his career, he had been a Vice President at the American Trucking Associations with a particular emphasis on environmental issues. He's Maryland educated, both undergrad at the University of Maryland and with a master's from Johns Hopkins. We are also joined today by Finch Fulton of Locomation. Finch joined Locomation uh, earlier this year after serving as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Policy at the US Department of Transportation. His new role at Locomation is as the Vice President of Policy and Strategy. Finch, when it's your turn, I'm gonna let you describe Locomation, which I'm sure you'll do a lot better than I will. And uh, I thought we would start today. Oh, and finally, not, no, last but certainly not least, I've asked my colleague, Alan Adler of FreightWaves to join us. He's a senior editor. He writes a lot about lots of the subjects that we're gonna talk about today. He also publishes a newsletter every week called Truck Talk that, focus, that focuses on many of the issues of trucking and new technology. So I thought we'd start at the, kind of at the beginning with Mike, who can discuss the current state of gains in fuel efficiency and in trucking. They've been pretty stupendous over the last 10 years or so. So Mike, why don't you take it away? Yeah, thanks, John. Um, happy to be here. And I think we, you know, the, we've got a, a real balanced panel. This is like a three-legged stool, I think, with uh, what I'm gonna share and then Alan and Finch. So let's, uh, let's dive right in. We've talked about this as sort of, I've titled this freight efficiency during a move to, to zero emission vehicles. And uh, decarbonization uh, comes in uh, you know, many forms. Uh, it doesn't have to be just zero emission. So a little bit about 
NACFI, we're, uh, we're about 12 years old now, and we, uh, we're an unbiased uh, nonprofit working to help uh, lower emissions and save money uh, on mainly heavy trucks, but also in, in medium and heavy duty across both the U.S., Canada, and now also in Mexico. Uh, NACFI.org is where you can find a, a great deal of information, um, all free, um, given the sponsors that we have. So when we think about um, decarbonizing, uh, you know, there's a couple of aspects here. And as you can see on the bottom, um, there's no time frame. This could be decades um, or more that we're talking about here. But, um, you know, in the, as we count um, real heavy tractors out there and, and single unit trucks, you know, there's about 10 million of those, 10, 12 million of those, 2.8 million are the, the ones that are doing the, the long haul and regional haul uh, class eight kind of uh, uh, work that's um, creating a lot of the emissions and, and has a lot of the fuel burn. And we see over time a move to uh, battery electric vehicles and fuel cell electric vehicles uh, that will emerge for a, a, bunch of, a bunch of reasons, including sustainability, regulations, total cost of ownership, um, but also during that period of time, uh, and I'll get into this very soon here in my talk, um, you know, a lot of other technologies that are coming, um, including diesel. Uh, so it's going to be a wild ride with respect to the powertrain, we believe, over the next 20, 30 years um, in North America. And so here's sort of uh, how we view this in a, in a snapshot. Um, and so today, uh, you know, on the left, we've got, you know, uh, very mature diesels and natural gas, but immature new technologies. And there are many unknowns and challenges. And, you know, I even laugh sometimes when I talk to people about electric trucks and fuel cell trucks. I mean, there's people thinking that these trucks are already out there moving a lot of freight and they're not. They're emerging. They're coming out and, and they're here, but they're um, at the very early stages. Um, I'll jump clear to the right where for all those reasons I talked about, I, I think the future is um, electric vehicles with hydrogen fuel cells uh, being powered with clean renewable energy. And, and that day, um, whether it's for us, our children, or grandchildren, would be pretty interesting with respect to you know keeping our climate cool and um, you know and really saving money in the long term. Between here and there, though, we, we call it a messy middle here at NACFI, and, and, and affectionately so. I mean, there's a lot of technologies that are emerging. Uh, over the period of time, whatever that is, you know, in some cases we'll see battery electric trucks in smaller, smaller trucks, you know, this decade um, scaling pretty heavily. Uh, but in that longer haul, you know, much more challenging. So improvements in diesel, natural gas, um, you know, we got an announcement um, right now about a 15 liter Cummins natural gas engine, which uh, could run on renewable natural gas. And so that all of that will take place while we're also developing these battery electric and fuel cell trucks. So very interesting times for the industry and really in some ways quite challenging for fleets and manufacturers because the key here is for each of the technologies to, you know, what we're talking about is let's get round pegs and round holes. So where any of these technologies for powertrains work well, let's get those in those duty cycles the earliest. And so we've done a lot of work on electric trucks, uh, and we, we believe they definitely will scale in medium duty and in uh, even many class eight um, applications of what we call shorter regional haul. And, um, and that is, uh, you know, happening uh, as we speak. So battery electric trucks are, are a given. They're happening, and it will be how much of the heavy market do, are they able to do? I mean, how heavy will the batteries be? How much range will they get? How much cost will they have? What will be the economics, you know, and sort of the way we think about it, you know, we think 250 mile a day for a battery electric truck will be economically advantageous for fleets. But when you get above that, it'll be, you know, what, what happens with battery electric truck technology and what will happen with fuel cells and renewable natural gas and advanced diesel, et cetera, et cetera, in the, in the, heavy, in the heavy part of the market. And so I, I wanted to bring up, um, you know, a couple of points here around NACFI. We run a run on less uh, event, runonless.com, if you want to take a look. And we've run, we've conducted three now. And um, this is just a good way to talk about efficiency. So, uh, when, you know, in, in, a, in the United States, um, hauling freight with heavy trucks, uh, all the trucks that are in the population, that 2.8 million on my first slide, they average somewhere around 6.6, 6.7, 
uh, miles per gallon. Now they, they haul light, they haul heavy, they haul over the mountains, they haul on the flat, they go downhill, they go uphill. Uh, so, you know, 6.7, let's call it is an average, but we've shown in 2017 and the number is even higher now that 10.1 or 10 plus mile per gallon is possible. So technologies have emerged and Alan will get into it a little bit more, both on the engine side, the powertrain, aerodynamics, how you drive the truck, air, um, hoteling and so forth where there's a lot of opportunity to still improve the efficiency of the heavy tractor trailer. Uh, and then, you know, regional hall with e-commerce and so forth, that middle mile that many people talk about is growing. So, you know, there are challenges when you go on off of highway, do more start and stop, keeping that MPG up. Um, and then finally electric trucks. And, you know, in 2021, um, these are the 13 electric trucks that we followed last month. And, um, you know, I don't have time to go into the detail here, but drivers love them. Fleets are learning the maintenance benefits of an electric truck. I mean, think about it. It's, it's you plug it in, batteries, power electronics, it goes to the wheels, you run the truck. No after treatment, a lot less parts. I mean, uh, we, we're confirming with what we did here that a lot of those benefits for battery electric trucks are truly there. And then, uh, but there's huge challenges around infrastructure and so forth. Uh, when you get up into the higher uh, miles per day, less dwell time, where they don't return to base, all the things that many people are studying around electric trucks. But keep in mind, they will scale in the smaller trucks, and they'll find their place um, and be, you know, in in the the higher heavy duty challenges um, or challenges that heavy duty brings to it. Um, so quickly, uh, you know, the, these uh, these trucks are out there um, that are battery electric, uh, and we've, uh, you know, right now we've got these video case studies that exist uh, around medium heavy terminal tractors there in the middle, a really good application of electrification of heavy trucks, um, albeit a niche market. Uh, they stay at their uh, at their site moving trailers around the depots, and so we see that as a, a very early adopter. And then uh, left there, the um, heavy beverage, um, low miles, uh, they deliver to stores, our favorite bars, uh, you know, um, and, and, and that's a really good place uh, and, a, and a practical total cost of ownership place for electric trucks. Uh, there's also a lot of, uh, uh, you know, with, with this transformation to either electric trucks or ZEVs, uh, or ZEVs, whether it's electric or hydrogen fuel cell, there's a whole bunch of, of uh, pluses and minuses, benefits, challenges uh, with this, because it's a, you know, it'll be the biggest transformation in, in our careers in moving goods. And so, uh, uh, you know, we, we help tell those stories from these 91 interviews we did in the summer. And I'm not making run on less of sales. Or I'm not trying to, you know, push run on less on all of you, but uh, there's a lot of good insights there that we think are important as we, we think about uh, timeframes and forecasts and, and, and how this will emerge over time. And then there's the, you know, the, uh, the drivers, the information that um, about the, about the trucks and then the data. So um, these trucks are data warehouses, you know, the diesel trucks are, uh, you know, the, the, the massive amount of, of trucks that get built every day and are operated in the country have a lot of data on them, but these new trucks, the developers, um, you know, and Finch will talk about this in a little bit um, with automation. I mean, they are, studying these trucks and delivering data to the fleet like we've never seen before. And we were able to show some of that with run on less electric where you can see battery state of charge going down over time and how the trucks are used. And this is really powerful for making decisions on, on these vehicles as we move forward. So what do we see? We see electrification coming in wages sort of from the inside of the warehouse out, forklifts all the way out through drayage, short regional haul. I'm not sure yet where we're going to see longer regional haul and long haul trucks. And so that's where hydrogen come up. So I wanted to just take a couple of seconds and then I'll, I'll be out of here. But hydrogen is a real challenge. Um, you know, it's a you know, it's probably a regional decision more than just trucking. We, we've studied hydrogen in, in it's really kind of like a you know, it's really a um, you know, all the, the, the cards need to be lined here. We even talked about dominoes lined up for this to really work because we, we you know we want hydrogen to be green. We want the trucks to use it. Um, we got corridor charging. So. Um, it sounds like a really simple fix to the battery truck not making it, but um, there are huge challenges around hydrogen. So I'll close with this little thing. You know, this is, you know, all of these different technologies, whether it's diesel, advanced diesel, um, renewable natural gas, natural gas trucks, hybridization, and then the ZEVs. 
Um, you know, this isn't where one's going to win and the rest are going to lose. And, you know, from, from my seat in our chair, um, getting that round peg in that round hole um, in a team, you know, where the hydrogen people say, no, nope, this is really a battery truck's better for you in this duty cycle, or diesel says it's better for you because of this, that, and the other, that's where this will, transformation will be the most um, successful. And so with that, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Alan and let me stop sharing here and he'll, he'll have some comments and I'll be back for some uh, Q&A. Thanks a lot, Alan. Thank you, thank you, Mike. Thanks very much. Michael, let me uh, get my slides up here. There's my screen share. Well, let's see, my screen share thing is not showing up. Where is my screen share? There we go. Okay. Now we're set. Thank you very much, Mike and uh, John and others for having us. Great to be with you again. And uh, I thought I would just take a few minutes to talk about diesel a little bit. And um, you can see from the title I've picked here that, um, you know, we are uh, here to talk a little bit about uh, where diesel is today and where we see it uh, headed for the future. So, um, Indulge me on that for just a moment. Um, I want to thank the uh, the leaders of the Diesel Technology Forum, our members, uh, for making all this possible. And uh, you get the sense from looking at this slide that we have a great diversity in membership and uh, a lot of folks interested not only in diesel technologies, but uh, also uh, some of the other technologies Mike uh, spoke about uh, just a few minutes ago. So I want to cover with really three things with you this morning. First of all, some research findings uh, that give you a sense of the state of diesel today um, in the trucking industry here in the U.S., talk a little bit about trends, and what are the benefits uh, of this newer technology uh, generation of diesel? Um, and then uh, talk a bit more about the focus on why diesel is the technology of choice today, and also then how it stays competitive uh, in the future uh, on, that, uh, on that bridge uh, that Mike showed earlier. So um, we put together a, a research project at the beginning of the year, and uh, we commissioned IHS market and uh, automotive auto forecast solutions uh, to, uh, to conduct this work. Uh, so we took a look at all the vehicles registered and operating in the US today, commercial vehicles. And this slide summarizes those findings. I think you get the sense there's about 11 million diesels on the road. 76% um, of all commercial vehicles, class three through eight are powered by diesel. Um, and uh, we like to think about the, uh, the turnover in the fleet and the adoption of newer, cleaner, near zero emissions technology. Um, and uh, about a half a million new trucks across those class three through eight categories were added um, last year. Um, and you, you get the sense of what the penetration is from some of the alternative technologies Mike mentioned um, about 10,000 electric trucks showing up and about 60,000 CNG trucks and about 3 million gasoline in this uh, class three through eight range. Um, one of the things we focus on is uh, what is the, the state of technology of those diesel trucks on the road and 49% um, now are the newest generation of diesel. That means 2011 and later model year um, are the, uh, almost half of all those vehicles on the road. I'm, I'm pretty sure they're probably half uh, by now. And that was a 6% increase uh, compared to 2019. Um, so their continued investment in diesel is good, um, not just for manufacturers making those trucks, but also for, the, um, uh, for, for society and for the truckers that use them. Um, but just to level set everyone about what we are talking about when we say new technology diesel, we're talking about manufacturers of vehicles uh, since 2011. Um, and the new technology diesel involves these three elements of the system. Uh, uh, the ultra low sulfur diesel, of course, advanced engines and combustion technology, and then a highly integrated um, emissions control uh, system, the, uh, selective catalytic reduction, SCR as it's known. Um, and if we have a focus on the larger trucks, 97% um, of the class eights on the road today are powered by diesel. Um, and 50%, uh, fully 50% now are 2011 and newer. And so you um, you get the sense that that is a, um, a pretty good bump from, uh, from previous years. 
Um, and so uh, when we think about uh, this uh, new technologies and alternative fuels sort of coming into focus now for the market and uh, you know, why are we using diesel today? And uh, these are the same uh, points that will help us uh, determine about why and where diesel makes sense for tomorrow. Um, and uh, all of these factors taken together um, really deliver us the, uh, the incredible trucking system and goods delivery system that we have here in the U.S. today. And, uh, you know, it's the reliability, it's the highly availability. Um, over 100,000 fuel retailers have diesel in place today, extensive service and parts networks. Um, it, is a, it is a technology that uh, reaches every corner of America. Um, and uh, increasingly, uh, the the, the two bottom bullets here really, I think, um, direct us to where this future lies for the technology. And that is uh, not only near zero emissions that we're achieving today, but also what the future holds in that regard. And also when we think about decarbonization, um, we also wanna think about all the different forms we can get carbon out of the, uh, out of the environment. And renewable fuels offer us an immediate um, uh, way to do that um, across all the existing fleet. No need for new trucks, no need for new infrastructure. Um, low carbon solutions across the wide latitude of vehicles can deliver some pretty impressive benefits. Um, and so uh, just to, to kind of jump back to our analysis, we can see, you know, uh, looking across the country um, where uh, certain regions have more of the new technology vehicles in the, in the population than others. Uh, we did this broken down by EPA regional maps. Uh, so you kind of get a sense here of the ranges um, anywhere from the, uh, the 43s out west, 43% of all the trucks registered in that uh, far left or western part of the U.S. are 2011 and newer. And then in some parts of the U.S., it's uh, much higher than that. In the region six in Texas down there, it's about 54.6%. So um, you get a sense that uh, things are fairly close, but there are some differentials. Um, and if we broke it down individually by state, you get a sense here of where uh, some states rank. This is the top 10. Indiana is number one. Um, a footnote on that for everybody, and of course, uh, those of you in the trucking industry know this, that Indiana has some particularly good um, registration um, uh, things for, for fleets in terms of how to register vehicles there. Uh, they make it easy. So um, there's a good percentage of those trucks that are registered in Indiana showing up here probably that that only maybe are running a few miles a year there, but um, that is, uh, that is uh, uh, not part of the research that we did. We're just making observations about market penetration. Um, so what does all that mean? Uh, other than having new trucks on the road, we look at that in terms of benefits, and then we apply some EPA modeling to the fuel savings um, of emissions performance of these vehicles. And you get a sense that um, the impacts are pretty significant. And we might not think of these um, in the same way that folks are thinking in the future that if we had a fleet of all electric vehicles, for example, what would that mean for climate? Um, we're talking about what's happening now, what, what is happening in terms of CO2 reduction, what is happening in terms of NOx mitigation. And it's quite a considerable um, Im improvements um, since these new generation vehicles hit the road. And you get a sense of that uh, from this slide, almost 20 billion gallons of diesel saved and 200 million tons of CO2. What does that translate into? Um, if you're thinking about how many vehicles it takes off the road for a year, uh, it's 43 million. If you're thinking about um, uh, renewable electricity and sort of how that factors in, um, this uh, penetration of diesel trucks in the last uh, period has removed the much, as much CO2 as a wind farm with 42,000 turbines, about five times the size of Washington, DC. So, one of the points of this slide is um, we should value carbon reductions no matter how we get them. So let me finish with this final um, uh, piece here, and that is how does diesel play in the future? And it's really these four things uh, together. First of all, emissions closer to zero, and uh, that is uh, happening now in California, and also uh, consideration at the federal level. We expect uh, some new rules, to, proposed rules to come out next year on that. Um, the vehicles are becoming more energy efficient thanks to the existing greenhouse gas rules that are in effect and the constant customer demand for more fuel efficient vehicles. I mean, I think let's be clear. I mean, there's the government mandates uh, directing uh, lower greenhouse gas emissions are one thing, but uh, fleets have always wanted and, and invested in vehicles that are more fuel efficient than other vehicles. So that's always been there, but the vehicles are getting more energy efficient. 
We'll also see expanding use of renewables and hybridization where it makes sense in some of these medium range pickup and delivery kind of applications as well. Um, when we think about uh, this broad opportunity for renewable fuels, it is quite substantial. And if you look at where California achieved most of its CO2 reductions um, in 2019, and this is data from the Air Resources Board and Energy Commission, um, you get a sense that renewable diesel and biodiesel here in the green bars uh, dramatically reduce CO2 emissions in California. In fact, uh, more than five times the amount of uh, CO2 mitigation compared to all the electric vehicles combined. So um, this comparison helps us understand that all of these fuels and technologies can do uh, important things in terms of decarbonization. So my last uh, slide here, just a few thoughts. Uh, you know, I think we've seen uh, the evolution of diesel over time. Certainly when I got involved in this industry in the late eighties, we were spending a huge amount of time talking about smoking diesel trucks. Um, this is not really an issue anymore. I mean, since 2007 and new particulate filters, um, that has really eliminated that problem. And now we're really focused on uh, approaching near zero emissions uh, with, with, uh, with the advanced generation of diesel. This, uh, the use of renewable biofuels does bring, I think, some very fast and important carbon reduction opportunity uh, for some fleets in some areas. And I think like Mike pointed to, um, you know, you have to think about uh, what's the best decision in the best area. If you have a, a great access to renewable diesel fuel, and uh, have fleets in urban areas that might really benefit from that, you can start using that tomorrow and start mitigating CO2 emissions tomorrow, not maybe in five or 10 years when the infrastructure is available, but literally tomorrow. And this has been borne out in California over the last decade. Um, I think the greatest opportunity for alternatives to diesel um, is going to come, as Mike pointed out, in some of those short range regular route uh, areas um, I think, uh, you know, there are some very big questions about fuel access, refueling and charging that um, are really critical to determining the, uh, the penetration of those alternatives. Uh, but nonetheless, I think the more investment we have in the newest generation of diesel, the more benefits we're going to continue to accrue to the truckers that are driving these trucks and the communities that uh, these trucks are serving. So um, attacking all these challenges really requires more than one solution. And uh, the new generation of diesel is, uh, is one of them. So thank you. And let me uh, turn it over to, uh, uh, to Finch. Wonderful. So I am now moving to share my screen. Actually, Finch, we, we really like that background. Maybe you can, you know, keep just show the background for a while. That was, was really cool. <laughs> sure. Well, well, I'll get back to the background in a second after okay, I right. jam through some of these slides. Uh, so again, I'm Finch Fulton, the VP of Policy and Strategy for Locomation, which is a combination of the words locomotion and automation. We get a lot of confusion about the name. Um, and we are a Pittsburgh-based company that comes out of Carnegie Mellon, like all the best automated vehicle and automated trucking companies. Uh, we are located uh, down at Robotics Row, but we also have a testing facility out at the TRC in Ohio. Um, and unlike almost anyone else, unlike any other automated trucking company, we have two signed contracts uh, coming up and we'll be looking to deliver the first vehicles by the end of next year. And so you'll see the first deployments by the end of next year, as well as throughout 2023 and beyond. Uh, so that's not something, this isn't a reservation. This isn't a, you know, maybe I'll show up. This is a signed contract. So that's significantly different. Uh, and there are a few things that make us different. One is, of course, we have our automated vehicle technology. We have a different human-centric approach where we have a two-truck linked convoy uh, that uses two human drivers and two ARC systems, autonomous relay convoy systems, uh, to get the driver uh, on the road. They can turn on the system and they save on hours of service. I'll get into that more in a second. Uh, we also, I'll actually talk about the digital transportation system first. So, Sorry, it sounded like I was getting a question. Maybe, maybe we need to make sure everybody's muted because um, I will take questions later, but um, so after I set this baseline. Just thing. I had to do it on my laptop. Okay. So All right, uh, David, I think if you can mute um, or if somebody can mute him, that'd be great. Anyway, so uh, we've got the back-end organizational approach where if we want to have these linked two-truck convoys, we organize it on the back-end using machine learning and data from the actual carriers to make sure that we can combine these uh, vehicles so they can get the efficiencies that come from the system. 
Uh, and then, of course, we have our autonomous relay network that's based off of the uh, USDOT's trade analysis framework. You'll hear every autonomous trucking company talk about this framework. They may use different graphics or different maps. But the gist is that um, as you look at where the freight goes in the country and as you look at what goes on trucks, you can see where demand is and you can see where the possibilities are. For our two truck uh, link convoy approach, we're looking at about a thousand miles a day that drivers can drive um, using their hours of service. And so if you want to be able to get the drivers home every night, which we'll talk about again in a second, because it's important for driver retention, you're looking at a network across the country that utilizes the freight analysis framework to get drivers or to be able to drive the uh, containers 500 miles, drop and hook, and then the drivers go home, the containers keep moving on. So as we talk about this approach, um, again, two human drivers, two autonomous systems, obviously the thing that makes it different is um, we're going to be able to deploy because we can handle all of the things that a human does beyond driving, all of those uh, issues. So for us, both drivers leave the warehouse manually, they get on the freeway, and then they turn on the system. So the, the driver in the front vehicle uh, remains in control of their vehicle, and the following vehicle you know, works as sort of like a digital dolly or a remotely guided vehicle where it's following the lane line and the truck in front of it using its automated systems to follow, um, you know, seven hours in or however long uh, to make sure that they get their 30 minute break, the drivers can switch uh, so that they can uh, reserve their hours of service and stay in compliance. Um, they can keep going until they get to their end point. Let's say it's 450, 500 miles away. On the way back, they essentially swap out. And so that way they can drive almost continuously because they can get those you know, 22 hours a day of driving time that drivers can use where the human driver is allowed to go. And then, of course, what makes us different as well is it's not the focus on just hub to hubs. When you get to the end of your freeway, freeway stretch, uh, you're able to just have the human drivers take back over both of them and they can drive the final mile, five miles, however long to the end point. So that makes a significant difference when you're talking about being able to capture those benefits today and to be able to get on the road tomorrow. So the gist of it is you can take twice as much cargo, twice as far, twice as fast while obeying speed limits because you're using the human uh, hours of service uh, and the human drivers. Reduces operating costs, it uh, bumps up the equipment utilization because it's not sitting there idling somewhere or resting while the driver's getting their mandated rest. And we'll talk about this more, the CO2 emissions um, are significant. And as you look at this approach and what this means compared to some of the other models for solo autonomous trucking, you can capture many of the benefits today. It may not be as applicable when you turn on the autonomous system to as much, but you can capture most of those benefits and you're not waiting for the regulations or the technologies or certain providers to fully establish redundancy in their approach. Uh, all of those things that are important for safety, you can use the human drivers to take advantage of these systems today. And so it's the fastest path to the market. It's the smartest path to the market. And as we develop our systems, we'll be, develop, we'll be using real world data um, and working with real customers in revenue generating loads to be able to train the system further and to be able to take on those uh, approaches that are further out. So policy impacts and why this sort of matters for everyone on the call. You've seen many of these key industry trends. Uh, the amount of freight that needs to be moved every day is increasing. The time uh, for delivery is decreasing with everything going on with on-demand e-commerce. And those, those trends are gonna keep continuing. Uh, most truck drivers aren't operating for the majority of the time that they're around. They have to take mandated rest periods. Um, and there's a 60,000 truck driver shortage. But if you look at these big picture items, so there's a truck driver shortage and demand is increasing. There's over 100% turnover in most of these long haul trucking companies, because these are tough jobs and they can uh, at times not pay well. You have uh, poor matching. So you have 16% of miles these truck drivers drive are without a load and they get paid by the mile that they deliver loads. So these are deadhead miles that are just costing the truck drivers. Um, with that great turnover comes higher safety issues because new truck drivers aren't as safe as truck drivers that have been driving for a long time that understand what's going on. Uh, obviously, they're very frustrated about the lower utilization of their vehicles that, you know, many times truck drivers are paying for in companies. So this causes frustration. This can cause them to do unsafe activities like trying to beat the clock on hours of service. So they're speeding to get where they need to go because they don't want to, you know, get caught somewhere in a city. They're taking inappropriate actions and speeding is the highest, uh, highest cause for crashes of truck drivers that truck drivers themselves are the critical factor for. So all these things play into each other. And if you can remove that temptation to speed by being able to give them hours of the day back, 
uh, and if you can improve the amount of time they get sleeping, you're saying that the top two causes, sleepiness and uh, speeding, those are addressed. So there's safety impacts as well as some of the other impacts. But today, of course, it's mostly about emissions. This is word soup, but you know, feel free to take a screenshot um, or do whatever you want. Um, so there's a few things that we're trying to bring into play as we look at the technologies and their impact on emissions. Uh, first, with platooning alone, uh, as I mentioned, we have a two-truck convoy approach. The platooning aspect is the uh, longitudinal, it's the, it's the distance between the vehicles, the way that these systems control for the distance between the vehicles. You can get 8% fuel efficiency off of that platooning. Of course, with convoying, it's both the following closely as well as the lane control. So that's the difference between a platoon and a convoy. Um, you know, a great NACP report that was very informative was that if you remove the idling time, which we do because they're not stopping, you know, turning on their AC in a Texas summer or their heat in a cold winter, that saves, you know, I don't have to read the stats for you, but a significant amount of CO2 a year if you reduce or eliminate the idling time because truck drivers are getting back to their home base every day. And then you see some of these other factors with the speed smoothing, with the reduction of need to uh, speed, if you're looking at the efficiency gains you can get, um, but also some of the other things that you may not think to take into account. If, an, if there is an hour a day that truck drivers spend looking for parking, that's wasted time for everyone. And that has significant impacts to traffic congestion, to truck driver safety. I haven't validated this stat, but I heard someone else at a different panel talking about that, you know, once every two weeks, a truck is crashed into and somebody dies. If they don't have to be spending time looking for a parking spot and Unfortunately, parking on the side of the road, you can save lives there as, as well. And then as you look at the um, duty cycle of these trucks, um, you, you increase the incentives to invest in the different technologies that can save fuel, whether or not it's advanced diesel technologies, electrification, or even the things like the you know, wind shears that help with the efficiency of the vehicle that only work on interstates, but don't work in the urban uh, situations. So you have more incentives to invest in those technologies that already exist today and have been around forever when you simplify the duty cycle and start bringing on these organizational approaches. So what, what that means, and we're getting these numbers validated by an independent third party so that we can blast them everywhere. Um, the, the math we've done shows a 62 metric ton average emissions reductions per truck per convoy. So for each truck, that's the equivalent of moving 13 passenger vehicles from the road every year. With just our first two customers, you're looking at over the equivalent of removing over 28,000 passenger vehicles from the road. Uh, and then so on, if we take over the world, the entire market, we went out, it'd have even greater um, impacts. But if we're looking at emissions reduction, you know, the transportation sector in the US causes roughly a fourth, a little over a fourth of the greenhouse gas impact. Of that fourth, of the transportation fourth, uh, medium and heavy duty trucking makes up a little less than a fourth. So if we're looking at that one eighth of overall emissions in the US, and then we find a way to reduce, let's say a fifth, it's a little less than a fifth of those emissions and you know, saving uh, a fifth of the price of fuel that trucking companies have to spend, that makes significant impacts. There's you know, 100, less times, 100 times less commercial motor vehicles than light duty vehicles on the road. So any impact you can make to that fuel efficiency and fuel savings has outsized impact to the entire sector. So when we look at what the country is facing and the regulations coming up and how, you know, is the Biden administration or otherwise is going to be tackling these issues, these are the regulations that we got to keep in mind. Uh, some of them are simpler, like the automatic emergency braking. Um, you know, everybody will be able to comply with those. But if we look at, I'll take the FMCSA one first. So that one they said would come out this month. Um, obviously, it hasn't yet. And I haven't heard any rumblings that that one's going to come out. But that is the regulations around um, how, a, how you can accomplish managing the other things that are required of a human in a trucking operation. So you can have the driver be replaced by a machine, but what are you gonna do about inspection, maintenance, repair, uh, putting out flares or warning triangles on the side of the road if something happens, um, interacting with law enforcement officers, um, you know, managing work zones, things like that. Nobody has alternate means of compliance for this yet. You can't deploy today, even if the technology is ready, because these things can't move forward. And I'll note, you know, this is laughably wrong and optimistic. Um, this is the timeline if everybody knew what they were doing already, and they don't. And so this is very wrong. Um, and it's just based on taking a year to a year and a half to move any regulation through the machine that is the federal government, if everyone agrees and everyone concurs. You know. 
minus the impact of the Teamsters or organized labor on not wanting them to move forward to regulation, I don't know, getting pretty close to an election year. So you can imagine that if you can have a human-centric approach, you're much better off. Uh, then we have other things. The NITS, the one on automated driving system safety. This is going to be where the federal government for the first time regulates the operation of a vehicle, not just the equipment. This one, um, you're seeing many approaches that, that people are taking to making the safety case. This is somewhere in the future. Um, I'll skip through these, but some of the other ones that are most important for this group is when you look at these NHTSA EPA uh, fuel efficiency and greenhouse gas standards. So the conversations I've had with everyone at NHTSA and you know, elsewhere, when we get to the standards that are going to be put in place in 2027 that are already coming, those are almost impossible to meet without bringing in more of these advanced technologies that, that can improve the efficiency of the vehicle. We'll see in 2024, uh, I think Alan maybe mentioned it, we're going to see another rulemaking that's going to start looking at where we get into uh, 2030. Um, so we have two updates, 2027 and 2030. It's got to be impossible to meet that unless you're bringing in these advanced vehicle technologies. And so as we look, you know, roughly a decade away from when these are coming in, we have to take both the embrace of technology and the embrace of the operational efficiency. Both of these go into the rulemakings that EPA and NHTSA put forward. We have to build those in and be planning for those now, or else you're going to be sunk. If you are not planning for 2027 or 2030 today and thinking through what that means and, frankly, making comments on the rulemakings that are coming up, as difficult as they are to figure out, uh, you're behind. And so those that can embrace technology and plan for the future will be the ones that really thrive in the future. Because I can make jokes about how long it's going to take FMCSA and NHTSA to move forward with the automated vehicle rulemakings. Those NHTSA EPA rulemakings are not only a priority for the Biden administration, but also they're mandated by Congress. The increases in steps uh, for fuel efficiencies, that's going to happen no matter who is president in 2025, 2026, you get it. Um, so with that, you know, I know there's lots of questions on will the technology be ready first or will the regulations be ready first? For us, it's going to be the technology because we'll be out there deploying with the human centric approach that makes sense today and is an evolutionary approach to full automation. So with that, I'll turn the floor back over. I'll let you see my beautiful background uh, and be ready to answer any questions. All right. Great, Finch. All right. We're going to turn now to my colleague at Freightways, Alan Adler, who has written about these issues for all his time at Freight Waves and was involved with them previously. So Alan, just if you could just chat generally, what are some of your thoughts about the state of technology? It was interesting last point that Finch made, the technology would be ahead of the regulations. Where do you see the technology? How do you see batteries versus hydrogen versus, you know, we, we have the news today about natural gas and the Cummins engine. Uh, where do you see the state of play? Well, thanks, John, and thanks for having me. I, I guess I, I listen to each of them. I, I, I don't know you, Finch, but I have certainly talked to Alan and, and to Mike uh, before. Um, I would say that, you know, we're, we're sort of uh, coming into a period where sort of, as, as Mike put it, there are no losers, but there are winners. And there are some that are quite honestly farther ahead than we might think. I've been had the opportunity recently to, uh, uh, you know, ride in a couple of autonomous trucks, most recently with Embark trucks. And I can tell you, it, it's pretty stunning how far along these have come. Now, does that mean we're going to see these on the road in the next five or 10 years and in big numbers? The answer is no. But I think the technology is way farther along than a lot of people think. And I'm heading out to Too Simple uh, tomorrow to take a look at, at, you know, experience what they're doing. So I think starting with the autonomy space, uh, it really is moving very quickly. I think there are a few issues yet to solve. And I know that, you know, locomation's approach is to sort of, you know, apply level four to the convoying as they prefer the term to platooning. But I, I really feel like some of this level four work, the autonomous trucks driving themselves, especially on hub to hub type uh, activity is very close. And I think you're gonna see it in that 2024 time frame might slip a little bit, but I think you're going to see it then. And I think that there are different approaches out there uh, in terms of build-up trucks. You know, Daimler is doing two approaches. They're taking a build-up truck. They, they purchased a, a Torque, uh, Torque Robotics uh, three years ago, and, and they're working on a Class 8 Freightliner that they're building up from, from scratch. And they're also purchasing the fifth-generation software from Waymo, which, of course, was the um, outgrowth of the Google self-driving car program. So they're sort of placing two bets on autonomy. Um, maybe the Waymo version gets there first, but the fact is they're all in on it. Um, uh, you know, we're gonna see, I think it's November 4th is the date that we just heard that that uh, 
uh, Aurora Innovation, which I think is is one of Locomation's uh, uh, suite mates out there in uh, uh, Robot Row uh, in Pittsburgh. Uh, they're going to go public through their SPAC. They've got uh, uh, partnerships both with Volvo Truck and with um, PACAR. So they're all moving ahead, but there are uh, technologies, and I think you look at like an Embark trucks and you look at uh, Kodiak Robotics that are looking more at doing uh, systems for these trucks because trucks are obviously specced individually or the, the duty cycles and needs that they have. And so they're looking more at doing sort of the componentry and the systems for these trucks rather than a full truck. So you've got a lot of divergent approaches. Um, locomations is one, and it is interesting because they do have, and I've talked to the folks at Wilson, um, you know, for a story we did on locomation about, I don't know, four, six weeks ago. And I think that, you know, there is something there. I think we're going to find out just, uh, you know, how valuable um, it turns out to be over the next uh, few years. But I, I do think that, you know, the technology is moving very, very quickly. Um, I took a couple of notes on what Mike said, because, you know, we talk, you know, pretty regularly. And it, it's very clear that um, that messy middle that he talks about is, is very true. And, and I, I can't really disagree with much of anything that he said, nor, nor do I have a reason to. But, but I think that you've got... Um, You've got electrification that has some some value, but also the fleets that have been testing it are finding, uh, especially with the sort of day cab, the class A day cab, they're finding that there is uh, an upper limit really to the to the value of electrification, and that's somewhere around 300 miles on, on a route. Um, so that then raises the hydrogen issue. I happen to believe that you know as someone pointed out, hydrogen has a lot of challenges ahead of it, but there are people that are very heavily involved in it, and you're seeing much more of the hydrogen production story uh, playing out now uh, around the world as well as as well as here. I mean, I've been quite honestly amazed. I mean, Nikola has been through some very difficult times, but they continue to make announcements about things that they're doing, uh, most recently with, uh, I think it's TC Energy out of Canada, uh, about building out hydrogen infrastructure because this whole chicken and the egg thing is real and it's got to get addressed on hydrogen. Um, you know, John, I can stop there if you like, or I can keep going. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's great. I mean, you, we could have kept listening to you just jumping on anything. I, I did, you mentioned Wilson Logistics and I did want to go to Finch and Alan, maybe you, because you wrote the story. You know, I, I think I wrote the original story when it was announced that Locomation and Wilson Logistics had signed a deal. And um, Finch, why don't you talk about where that's at and you know, what do you have to do with a company that you sign up to say, okay, we're going to do automation with you. I mean, this is a lengthy process. I can't remember when I wrote the story, it was a while ago, and uh, you're 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 getting there, but you're not ready to go yet. So you can see the, the 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 runway needed to get something going like that. What do you do with Wilson Logistics? I'm assuming you probably have a a mass of people on the ground at their headquarters to to make this work. Well, it's of course been through Zoom like calls with them uh, most recently, but we are pairing up, and you again have sort of the two products or services that you're working with them on. First is just the ingestion of their data and to start thinking through the operational efficiencies you can get with matching and otherwise. And it, you don't have to think of it as being any more complicated than Excel sheets and equations, even though it is slightly more complicated than that. But using some of the machine learning practices to be more predictive on where the freight loads are coming, because uh, this is not the correct number, but let's say 80% of those are going up and down the same routes every day, which is I-5. Um, you're able to start thinking through a lot of efficiencies when you can capture that and start planning for, you know, what the next few weeks ahead are going to look like, whether you're talking about drivers or otherwise. So that's one approach where we're working with them on their data and the organizational side of it. And the others, of course, is going to be all the steps it takes between here and the end of next year for not only the, the development and delivery of their truck, but the training of their drivers, the making sure that they have their safety practices in place, the preparation for, you know, talking to the regulators everywhere along the Northwest Passage and up and down I-5, um, you know, having lots of those conversations to make sure we will be fully compliant when those times come. Um, so it's sort of those three different approaches, the safety approach and the integration of the technology approach, the preparation for working with regulators, and then the back-end organizational approach to make it all make sense and to reach its maximum potential. And, and, and Wilson's, John, I'm sorry, Wilson's piece of that is, is simply, they say, look, um, we're looking at the routes we're running now, we're looking at where the high value routes are, that we can make this work. So, so I think Wilson also is putting in some significant effort at this point to identify those routes within this, um, boy, I get this wrong, Finch, but autonomous relay network, right? Did I get that right? But uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, I, I mean, you know, they're clearly looking at, you know, what do they need to do to get ready as well? 
And, uh, you know, but they also emphasize, as you did, the safety aspect. They won't put anybody in, in a convoy of any kind until they're sure it's safe. Yeah, let me, let me ask, though, and this is kind of the human aspect of this, uh, and I'll ask Alan or Finch. Um, you have to have a mindset within management to do this. I mean, this is a big leap forward for them. And uh, you can imagine some other companies saying, I'm not going to touch this with a 10-foot pole until this is already established. And here you have a company that's saying, you know, we want to be the leader in this. What can you say about the, the management at Wilson that their philosophy and their mindset is that they can be a real pioneer here? Yeah, well, there's lots of advantages to being to having leadership that's willing to embrace innovation. Uh, certainly everything that you can talk about with retaining drivers because of this approach, you do have to have that focus on safety. You get the operational efficiencies and the fuel efficiencies of you know potentially up to 20%. Um, and then you get things that will help you increase your customer base because of the benefits that come to the shippers as well. You know, there's a lot of requirements around uh, scope one and scope one and scope three GHG greenhouse gas emissions reductions that carriers and shippers, I uh, should say, need to capture, uh, especially if they're publicly traded. I mean, there's pressure all along the way for everybody to improve um, their emissions reductions programs. And so those that can show that they have a path for the shippers to be able to get, you know, your basic uh, cost savings with fuel efficiencies, but also to make them more attractive to investment, um, that goes a long way. And those that can embrace it first will be the ones that will be able to grow market more quickly and to gain that advantage that, you know, hopefully they can keep for the long term. I, I would just say, I would just say, John, on the uh, everybody on the on the issue of of early adoption and and, and uh, you know acceptance. PGT just last week uh, signed out with Nikola to yeah you know, basically letter of intent to take a uh, hundred uh, fuel cell trucks right over a certain period of time when those trucks come available in 2023 or or maybe a little later. But so it's interesting that the the innovative companies tend to show up in a lot of these things. Think about Penske. Think about Ryder. Think about uh, NFI. I mean, they've been involved, uh, NFI Industries have been involved in electrification really uh, pretty much across the board. And so when California is subsidizing uh, trucks to uh, electric trucks to essentially give away, really, uh, NFI gets 50 of them, right? And, uh, and, and Schneider gets 50 of them. So there's a lot out there that is not high risk in terms of financial investment when others are paying the bill, right? You know, John, this is Mike, if you don't mind, um, there's, a, there's an underlying change in moving freight here that is enabling a lot of this, I think. Um, so, so some people say, why now? You know, why do we have automation, electrification, hydrogen? Why all this stuff coming together now? And, and you know, there's a lot of reasons, but, but one that's not typically talked about a lot is just the, or, the more organized and, and, and um, predictable movement of freight. You know, with with big data and everything that we're able to, to use, we now know more about where these trucks are going and we can keep trucks in lanes um, that benefits a lot of things. You know, um, fuels with, with with charging infrastructure, as Alan mentioned, you know, if we're if we can keep a truck, you know, it, historically, we didn't care. Right. We just ran these trucks all over the country. And if one truck was going somewhere and then was in a dedicated route for a month and then it went somewhere else. We didn't really care because of diesel fueling and so forth. But now, you know, some people, maybe me, have said that uh, freight's gone from a hockey game to, you know, more of an organized sort of theater performance, you know, maybe jumping from sports to, to arts. But, I, 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 you know, it's not completely there, but more freight is predictable. And with that has offered opportunities for automation and these um, alternative fuels, we believe. Well, Mike, you gave me a perfect, by, by saying alternative fuels at the end, you gave me a perfect lead in to ask Alan something. Uh, renewable diesel is a terrific product, uh, but I think there's a few cracks in it. Uh, number one, Alan, is that um, it, it is so heavily used in California because of the LCF, because of the low carbon fuel standard program out there and the big credits that you get for using it. That's number one. Number two, the cost of feedstocks has become very high recently. And a couple of plants have shut down, not, not shut down permanently, but, but halted operations uh, because they simply can't make it. You know, one, one thing about oil is that the price of crude and the price of diesel and gasoline, the products that come out of it will ultimately trend in the same direction. I mean, there, there can be movement within the spreads, but because you can't do anything with crude oil except make gasoline and diesel with it uh, and other things, um, they're going to tend to trend together. With renewable diesel, there are other things you can do with soybeans. Uh, for example. Uh, there are other things you can do with palm oil. 
not really a lot of other things you can do with restaurant grease. But anyway, uh, is the renewable diesel market and this uh, and this push for it a little bit too dependent upon the, the breaks in California and just government regulation in general? It's an interesting uh, question, John. I think, you know, look at the corollary between all the other alternative fuels that have been heavily subsidized. Um, natural gas going back 10, 15 years. And, uh, you know, now we're talking about electrification and hydrogen. So the notion that, you know, one state policy or incentives, uh, and California's is really more the policy approach with the low carbon fuel standard than it is incentives, which is affecting some of the other technologies. Um, but um, I, I would say it's really more about growing pains in the industry. And if you look at what's happening in the, uh, in the traditional petroleum refining space, let's say, uh, where companies like Phillips 66, Marathon, Diamond Green, and others are all building uh, renewable diesel refining capacity to be able to boost supplies of renewable diesel to a, a considerable, much more level than they are today just to serve California, I mean, that suggests to me these companies um, have some angles on feedstocks and other things that are going to make that kind of investment economically worthwhile, not in the next year, maybe, but in the next two to five years. And uh, uh, Stratus Advisors has put together some really good analysis on this. And I think if, uh, if I'm recalling correctly, that if all the capacity came online, as, as folks are anticipating in the next few years, it would be enough to replace all the diesel fuel in California that was used in 2019. So there could be a considerable bump in capacity for renewable diesel. And of course, the feedstock equation is part of that. And, uh, you know, that's those, those companies, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to figure that out. And uh, I suspect that when you're making these announcements about investment, um, you've already got that figured out. So you're, you're, you're there. So I think it's got, you know, great potential outside of California. And uh, as, as has been alluded to by others here, you know, we're thinking more carefully about how we do things and you have niche environments and places, um, urban areas and cities that people are, are, you know, making a lot of requests of their policymakers for achieving near zero emissions or to have uh, uh, start tackling climate change immediately. And the time factor and with, with uh, some of those voices and groups is quite considerable, but, you know, the opportunity and the, the likelihood that's going to be delivered by things like fuel cell or full electric vehicles in many of these places is, I think, been oversold. That the timing um, depends on so many factors, on infrastructure investments, and other things have to fall in place to, to have a nexus of opportunity for these alternatives that uh, could be places where you could start really reducing carbon emissions today. Um, by using more uh, low carbon renewable biofuels, not just renewable diesel, but basic biodiesel as well. And the Northeast is a classic example of this. As they you know, start to think about uh, electrification and, and other things, um, it might be quite a considerable amount of time to build that infrastructure out. And I think just yesterday, the Washington Post had a pretty considerable uh, detailed story about uh, we're pushing very hard for electrification of electric vehicles, et cetera, but our grid might not just be ready for it. So um, many factors have to come into place and renewable fuels like biodiesel and renewable diesel are, are near-term available options and will become more available. Uh, and, and I think as good or better choices uh, for some fleets uh, in the near future. And we do have a question from the audience right along with that. Does renewable diesel cause any engine problems? I think the, the renewable diesel is a drop-in hydrocarbon replacement for existing conventional diesel fuel. And uh, we have, I never heard of reports of uh, renewable diesel having any kinds of issues with uh, with either new or older uh, technology diesels. I think you know one of the questions going forward is will there be uh, a need to optimize some of the future generations of internal combustion engines so they could uh, be optimized towards a renewable diesel fuel instead of just conventional uh, ULSD because there are some ignition properties of renewable diesel fuel um, that that could be uh, Enhance, could further enhance the benefits of renewable diesel if a particular engine or vehicle was, was designed with that in mind, or at least had that flexibility to have, okay, we want to use more renewable diesel in this vehicle, so um, we're going to adjust things accordingly. That would make that efficiency boost greater, the CO2 reduction better, and emissions reduction better as well. So let's point out that, that, that let me just point out on that I think you know part of the part of the motivation for that question from the audience is that et, too much ethanol can cause engine problems in cars 
and too much biodiesel can cause engine problems in trucks. So, Alan, go ahead. Yeah, yeah uh, no. Alan, I, would, I, I just want to ask you, Alan, and I've asked this question of, of, of the Diesel Technology Forum over the years, and that is uh, with California, you sort of have this um, good versus best uh, conundrum, really. And California wants uh, diesel essentially off the road because low uh, emissions isn't good enough. Uh, again, I'm just paraphrasing what you hear every week. Uh, are you are you fighting a, a, an uphill battle? I know you've got dominance right now. You pointed that out in your slides. But are you fighting an uphill battle against a, a state that really does influence a lot of things in terms of, you know, sort of a good solution versus, in their, in their words, a, a best solution? Well, I think it's no secret that California has some of the most progressive policies that are encouraging alternatives to diesel and, and uh, has for many years. I think, um, you know, that is, uh, you know, that is their, uh, their situation, their choice in terms of air quality. They're making, you know, quite a, quite an investment to uh, achieve not only their, their clean air standards, but also their greenhouse gas uh, goals in the state. So, um, I think, though, that um, in doing that, there's also become a realization that things may not happen as fast as they might have anticipated. And the fact that even California is telling folks, you know, well, with after 2040, um, we're going to, the diesel is still going to be the dominant technology on the road. I mean, I think let's, let's just let that settle in for a minute. You know, it's 2021 and, and 2020 and 2040. That's you know 19 years from now, diesel is still going to be the dominant technology out there. So that means that we're going to have a couple more generations of people investing in diesel. So I think um, the, the rhetoric is starting to, to maybe, uh, maybe more align with reality in some ways in California, um, as they see some of the, uh, the, what it's going to take to do the heavy lifting to get the kinds of penetrations of these new fuels and technologies that require such considerable investment, um, that diesel is still going to be around for a while. And uh, we need to optimize the, the benefit of that. Hence their ultra low NOx regulation they passed last year. Um, the low carbon fuel standard, I've already uh, demonstrated, I think that diesel is delivering the predominance of benefits there. So, you know, sure, California has not been, uh, I would say necessarily a friend to uh, uh, pro diesel policies, um, but by the same token, I think, uh, you know, there needs to be a reality check and realization that this is a technology that's really been evolving quite dramatically. California has pushed diesel far to develop into more efficient near zero emissions technology. And why would we want to take the opportunity to use that away in the future? I mean, why, why, would, we, uh, why would we put all this investment into making these near, even nearer to zero emission engines and then, and then take them off the table as a viable option for, for fleets out there? I think that... Um, <laughs> You know, I, I just I just don't understand that uh, that the logic is not there on that. I think one of the things that that is clear, if you look at some of that data in California, they lag the nation in terms of the penetration of new technology diesel vehicles, and that's due to a variety of factors. Um, I would say not the least of which is some of their own um, uh, regressive policies on fleet requirements for the truck and bus fleet rule. So folks have been holding on for older technology for longer, and when in fact they could go out and buy a new generation diesel truck and put it on the road today that's going to be getting you know 15 percent better fuel economy than the old vehicle much better emissions much lower co2 so we we really want to be thinking about the short term and the immediate term um, as well as that long term and i think california has has had that really long visionary look but in the course of doing that maybe neglected some of these near-term uh, emission reductions and efficiency opportunities that this advanced generation of diesel brings and the reality of it's going to take a lot of time to turn over big, big fleets of numbers of vehicles to other fuels and technologies. Not saying that that might not be a good thing when it's ready and when it's available, as Mike is pointing out uh, with his uh, great work um, every year. But, you know, by the same token, we have tremendous advancements in the existing diesel. Um, let's leverage that to the best we can to get the most benefit now. Um, and uh, and keep folks a uh, progressive uh, guy in a new truck is going to be better than a guy in an old truck, no matter what uh, what it's burning or what it's uh, powered by. All right. Speaking of Mike, thank you. You gave me a nice little intro to Mike there. Mike, you referred uh, in your presentation to hybrid vehicles. And the term hybrid, I think, can have a lot of definitions. You know, when it first came into the issue of, of a 
a vehicle motion. It was you know, a classic uh, hybrid with a, a battery in a car that, you know, so the engine shut off at the red light, that kind of thing. Um, when you talk about hybrid and truck, I mean, I can envision combinations that would all be considered hybrid, but when you say hybrid, what are you thinking of mostly? What, well, what so, would a hybrid you know, truck look like? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm happy to answer that. I mean, so the, um, uh, you know, we've got a plethora of fuels and then you can put on top of that more complexity to say, okay, well, let's take any of those fuels. We got liquid, hyd liquid hydrogen, gaseous hydrogen, you know, propane and smaller trucks, on and on and on. You can take any of those uh, engine power plants and turn it into a hybrid. And so where you, you know, either plug in a, the, a battery pack or you create electricity uh, for that, um, uh, you know, for that hybrid truck. So a hybrid truck can either be mild in that it's, um, you know, uh, using regenerative braking to extend the, the range through energy recovery, or um, as we've seen with Hylion, you guys have written about Hylion, they're, they're looking at a small, smaller uh, renewable natural gas engine in some cases to create electricity on the truck, um, which we consider a hybrid. So there's a lot of hybrids out there um, actually causing this messy middle to be a little more messy, John, quite frankly. And one of the things we worry about with uh, hybrid vehicles is, you know, the um, internal combustion engine truck now has become pretty complex. I mean, um, th this after treatment works extremely well, um, you know, now, and um, but, but it's complex. And, and to get these kind of fuel economy levels that we're talking about, we're adding more technology on the truck. So the battery electric, you know, we always say that the, the, the sort of the engine ICE truck of today is here at complexity. Um, a battery electric truck is much less in complexity uh, of moving parts and, and stuff that, that can go wrong. And then basically a hybrid, you know, you have both. So, um, you know, the gains in maintenance and, you know, simplicity of the truck and so forth is the uh, is the con of a hybrid, but it does help you with some of the some of the challenges of, of uh, some of these zero emissions. So, um, I, you know, I, you know, the, the, the messy middle, the, the thing that concerns us the most is that some of these solutions um, also have infrastructure also have, um, you know, things that need to be put in place. If you think about companies considering a movement to natural gas, they have to think about how do I charge it? How do I put uh, maintenance facility, not charge it, fill it? How do I put maintenance facilities in place? How do I train drivers on things? And, um, you know, if, if they go do that, and then the electrification comes quicker than we thought for their particular duty cycle, then they may be stuck with some assets that, um, you know, a better alternative that's coming down the road that they can't implement fast enough uh, for themselves. So I think with each of these alternatives and, and you know, um, Finch and Alan have both talked about some that are, um, you know, simpler to enter to, to, to deal with here in this messy middle. And, and in fact, some of these will help the electric truck down the road. You know, the platooning can help extend range of two electric tractors at some point as well. So a few thoughts there for you, John. All right, thanks. We're going to wrap up. Uh, John, I, 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 wanted to just, I wanted to just chime in there a little bit, just because I think that, um, you know, I was thinking about Finch's presentation um, and showing the incredible emission reductions that are possible from that automated technology. And when I think about what I hear from trucking fleets today, you know, they, if you sat them down and say, what's your number one problem today? I don't know that many of them are going to say, well, I can't find a fuel that's going to do me the, the, the good I need for today, or I'm really concerned about this. We're going to hear some complaints about diesel fuel prices, no doubt, but they're not, you know, saying, oh, I'm really confused. I don't know what the best choice is. They're going to say, we don't have enough drivers. We don't have enough drivers. And it's not a, 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 not a problem that's gonna get fixed this, this month, this year, in the next couple of years. So when you think about the, the opportunity for decarbonization and reducing emissions by uh, that automated technology and the, and the convoying of, of trucks, you know, one driver doing the work of two, I mean, th that's an immediate multiplier to make this industry work more efficiently. And, um, you know, not to disparage any of the great work that's being done in, in fuels or technology, but boy, you look at that and you have to say, man, that's solving a really big problem that's there today. And we think about carbon reduction, that's, that's, a, that's a really added benefit. Yeah, as it is now, when you look at the monthly employment report, which I write about for freight waves, they're getting more capacity by making everybody work longer. And seriously, the, 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 the data on hours work keeps rising. So. 
Uh, last question, I, I'd love to talk forever, but we're gonna wrap this up by 15 minutes after the hour. I wanna direct this to both Finch and Alan because they've got perspective. Uh, a lot of companies got mentioned today in your space, Finch. Obviously, Locomation be one of them. Uh, we mentioned Helion, we mentioned Nikola. Uh, Alan, you're taking a ride tomorrow, I think, with somebody. Uh, yeah, and I'm taking a ride next week uh, at ATA. There is a lot of companies in this field. Is there a shakeout uh, on the way? Well, and I'll, I'll just start. There's been the considerations of mergers and acquisitions for some time. We saw some consolidation about two years ago that lasted into the last year. Uh, right now, you've got seven major players in the space. Um, the two with human-centric approaches, Locomation and Plus, who you're going to see next week at ATA. Uh, you've got the passenger car companies that decided that they wanted to make money at some point, so they shifted into trucking, which is Aurora and Waymo. And so they're, you know, have a lot of history leaning into it, but they are what they are. Uh, and then you have sort of the pure trucking plays, which is your Kodiak, Embark, and uh, Too Simple. So I, I, th there's no math behind this, but I've heard that there's probably room for three to four major players in the space. Um, and then there may be others that look at more niche applications or markets, but I, I don't feel any major uh, consolidations coming in the very near future. Um, but maybe Alan has a different perception. Yeah, yeah I, I, I would. You, I, you wrote about Nikola for us, so you've got that whole history. Well, yeah, Nikola's actually not really in the autonomous space. I think from the autonomy perspective, there will be uh, some consolidation at some point. When you start looking at how certain companies are doing things very similarly, it, it, it probably doesn't work for everybody to be able to take just, you know, single digit percentages of this and that. You've got three autonomous truck companies right now in SPACs, uh, special purpose acquisition companies. Uh, Aurora looks like they're going to go public uh, early next month. Uh, I'm not sure where the plus one stands. And then, of course, Embark Trucks probably is is coming up before the end of the year, based on what I've been told. So I don't think it would be immediate, but I also don't think you're going to have six or seven companies out there five years from now. It just isn't probably isn't practical. All right. Well, hopefully we'll get this group together before six or seven years to talk about these issues again. They could go on forever, but uh, we've given it a good long ride. And I really do appreciate all of our panelists here today. My colleague, Alan Adler from FreightWaves, Finch Fulton from Locomation, Alan Schaefer from the Diesel Institute. And uh, wait, I think I described your, your, your group wrong. I didn't get the, the name right, Alan. Diesel Technology Forum. Diesel Technology Forum, thank you. And Mike Roth from, oh, I'm gonna mangle this one too, the North American Council for Freight Efficiency. Actually, I think I got that right. So anyway, thanks everybody for tuning in. And uh, David, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, John. Wow, what a wonderful webinar and a great lineup of talent here. Thank you so much. I, you know, this is the second uh, webinar that has really come together, uh, focused primarily on the trucking industry. So very, very important, not just for us in the States, but globally as well. And, and I do agree, I think, with Finch and, and Alan that uh, there's, there's some room for, for consolidation down the line here. Uh, but without a doubt, when you're driving down the road, you're seeing the trucks, they're moving product, they're moving the economy forward. And boy, is that what we need right now. So with that in mind, uh, for our listeners, this uh, webinar has been recorded, will be available on our Rewind station uh, later on this afternoon, open access to you all. So thank you once again. Wish you a good rest of your day, wherever this finds you on our fine globe. Thank you. Thank you, Dave.